Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, geographers. Welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we're going to be going into Unit 6, Topic 4. We're going to be looking at the size and distribution of cities. In this video, we're going to be talking about the rank size rule, primate cities. We'll be getting into the gravity model and the central place theory. This video is packed full of a bunch of different geography goodies. So hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and let's start learning, geographers. When looking at the size of different cities, we can see that countries often follow either the rank size rule or the primate city rule. Countries that follow the primate city rule traditionally have one large city. This large settlement has twice the population of the country's second largest settlement. While countries that follow the rank size rule will have a variety of larger settlements. Here, the second largest city in a country will have half the population of the largest city, with the third largest city having about a third, and the fourth a fourth, and so on. Societies that follow the rank size rule will have a variety of goods and services that are dispersed throughout society. This allows people to have more access to a variety of goods and services, which reduces the amount of time people have to travel for those goods and services. These countries also often have economic development dispersed throughout the entire country. On the other hand, countries that follow the primate city rule have wealth and goods and services centered in one large city. This makes it so citizens have to travel larger distances in order to be able to access the different goods and services that the country has to offer. These societies also often have unequal equal economic development, with most of the economic advancements focused in one city. This can make them more susceptible to economic challenges, since if anything happens to the primate city, the rest of the country will be significantly impacted. Since we're on the topic of size of cities, we should also talk about the gravity model. The gravity model tries to predict the likelihood of two places interacting. It looks at the distance between these two places and also the size of the population of each of the places. We can see that the larger the population population is of a city or a settlement, the more likely it is that people will interact with it. Cities and larger settlements often have more nightlife, entertainment, different job opportunities for citizens, a variety of goods and services for sale, different cultural groups, and also offer more social opportunities, economic opportunities, and political stability. All of this attracts people into these larger settlements. While on the other hand, smaller settlements just don't offer the same economic, social, and political opportunities that larger settlements settlements offer, so they're less likely to see people be pulled into their settlement. If you need help remembering the gravity model, just think about a large planet. The larger the planet is, the more mass it has. The more mass it has, the more gravitational pull it has, which means it's going to attract things into its orbit from farther away. Smaller the planet, the less mass there is, and the less gravitational pull. Large cities will attract people from farther distances because they have more opportunities. They have more pull factors. Smaller settlements just don't don't have the same capacity because they don't offer the same economic, social, and political opportunities. And this gravity model makes sense. If we go all the way back to Unit 2, Population and Migration, we actually referenced it when we went into Ravenstein's Laws of Migration. Remember when we were talking about migrants, especially migrants traveling long distances? Ravenstein noted that they're going to travel to large urban areas. And again, it's because of those pull factors. They want those economic opportunities. Now we spent some time talking about the size of different settlements and all of the interactions between them, but now we're going to move into the distribution of them. We're going to look at the distribution of goods and services and settlements as we talk about Kristaller's central place theory. The central place theory uses hexagons in order to illustrate the spatial layout and distribution of different goods and services and settlements. We can see that larger settlements have a larger pull factor. This allows them to have a larger range, and that's because they offer more goods and services and have more opportunities. We talked about this in the gravity model. And now the same goes for goods and services as well. We can see that some goods and services that are very specialized have a larger range because they'll pull people in from a farther distance. Now I just mentioned the word range, and when studying Kristaller Central Place Theory, you're going to have to understand what range means. When we're talking about range, we're talking about the distance people are willing to travel for that good or service or also that settlement. Traditionally, those will be located at the center of our hexagon. The larger a settlement is, the more a pull factor it has, the larger the range will be. Same thing if a service is more specialized or goods and services are more unique. They'll be more likely to travel larger distances, so our range will be larger. 
On the other hand, you're also going to hear the term threshold. Threshold is looking at how many people need to be within that range in order to support the goods or services, to make sure they're profitable and can stay open, or how many people need to be located in a city or a settlement for it to actually be sustainable. To better illustrate this, let's look at a couple different examples. We're going to start with some examples of goods and services, and then we'll work our way up to settlements. Now, on the right over here, we have Chipotle, and it's inside of a market area. Here we can see Cristaler's hexagonal shape. Now, what we're looking at is this market area. Chipotle is at the center, and going from Chipotle is our range. This is the distance people are willing to travel in order to get Chipotle. Now, anyone inside this would be known as the threshold. They are supporting this store location. If we were to leave this market area, well, we would see that we're in a different market then. Now, when trying to determine range, we have to be able to look at a variety of factors. People are willing to drive longer distances for more specialized goods and services, or goods and services that are more unique. Ones that are more common, people are less likely to drive a longer distance for, and so the range will actually be smaller. One thing I want you to understand about range, though, is that when we're talking about it, people often use time instead of miles to judge the range. For example, if you had an option right now to go to two different McDonald's, one was five miles away from your house and the other was 10, which one would you choose? You probably will pick the McDonald's that's just five miles away from your house. But if I was to tell you that that McDonald's that's five miles away from your house is five miles through traffic and rush hour because you're going through downtown compared to the McDonald's that's located 10 miles away from your house. However, all you have to do is hop on the interstate system and you'll be there in five minutes. Well, you'll probably decide to choose then the McDonald's that's farther away. And that's because you're thinking in terms of time. We could also see this too with subways. If we were to look at a large city, we can see that there's a lot of subways throughout the city. And that's because the range is quite small for these subways. They know that they need to put a variety of locations in there because they need to make sure they can be as close as possible to their customers. However, as we start to move away from a larger settlement and get into more of a rural area, we'll see subways subways are more spaced out, their range increases, and that's because the travel time to get to one is now less, and that's because there's less traffic. So we can see stores actually locate based on this model. So now you have a couple examples of goods and services that have a smaller range, but what about ones that have a larger range? Well here we can look at professional sports stadiums, specialized hospitals, large retail stores such as the Mall of America. All of these are great examples of goods and services that have a really large range and that's because they offer something that you can't find in other locations. Now it's not just range that determines the location of a business or a good or service, it's also the threshold. Remember thresholds the minimum amount of people needed for that business to actually be supported. How many people are going to be living within that market area, within our range? Businesses will often use census data to determine how many people are living in an area. They'll look at the demographics of the area, they'll also look at the medium income of an area. All of this can determine determine if they'll be able to open a store and if it'll be able to be profitable. This is why we see high-end stores, large airports, professional stadiums, and other specialized services located in large cities. These businesses have a higher threshold and need either a larger population or a more wealthy population in order to survive. Whereas a small restaurant or a thrift store would have a smaller threshold and need less people living near the market to sustain itself. So we've been talking now for a while about goods and services and Cristal or Central Place Theory. But like I mentioned earlier, it also works with settlements. Here we can see the spatial layout of different settlements throughout a country and a society. Here we can also see an urban hierarchy that starts to form based on the size of different settlements. Hamlets at the bottom, followed by a village, a town, and eventually a city. The smaller the settlement, the less goods and services they'll have, and that's because their threshold is so low, they don't have a large population to be able to support larger goods and services. So they rely on goods and services from other neighboring settlements. The larger the settlement is, the more specialized goods and services they have, the more they're going to be pulling people in from the surrounding area. This is what we talked about when we were looking at the gravity model. We're looking at this range and we're looking at the threshold. We're looking at the spatial 
pattern of the different settlements within a society or the relationships between these settlements, we can use Crystaller Central Place Theory to understand their location. We can see that a city is going to be located in the center of that hexagon. That's going to be kind of our center of the market area, with a town, the next largest population, located farthest away from the city. That's because their population's larger, they'll be able to provide more goods and services for themselves. Then hamlets and villages will be located on the outskirts of cities and also towns. They will then depend for their goods and services and their special needs for towns and cities, as they don't have a large enough population to do it themselves. You can see a great visual right over here. And while it may look confusing, notice that regardless of where you live, you have access to different goods and services, as all of our society now is connected by complex infrastructure. For example, the college I went to was in a smaller town. Now, we had our own Walmart and Target, but we didn't have a lot of the specialized chain stores. We didn't have a Buffalo Wild Wings or Chipotle. So if we wanted to get any of those goods and services, we would have to travel about 20 to 30 minutes to the next largest city. However, many people in the area traveled to that town for Walmart and Target because their location where they lived didn't offer any of those services. So we can see that these cities and settlements often support systems to the surrounding areas. This allows for specialization to occur and it also allows for us to make sure that we're able to sustain the goods and services we're offering. The cool thing about understanding the gravity model and also Crystaller Central Place Theory is you get to understand why our cities, why our towns, why our settlements are laid out the way they are. Why is it that a large city will have so many Starbucks? Or why is it that there's a gas station on both sides of a road? The gravity model and the central place theory help explain this to us. Businesses use these concepts to be able to understand where they should locate. And we can also look at our cities that we live in, or our towns, our villages, even our hamlets, and understand the relationship we have with the surrounding community. All of this connects back to geography. It's all spatial, and that's the best part of this class. Now, speaking of understanding, the time has come for you to make sure you're understanding these concepts and take the practice quiz. Answer the questions on the screen right now and check your answers down below. And if you found value in this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and consider dropping a like. All of this helps support the channel, allows me to make more videos, and make sure you don't miss out on any future videos as well. And if you need a little bit more help in your AP Human Geography class, check out my ultimate review packet. It is a great resource that covers all seven units of this class. It'll definitely help help you get an A in your class and a five on the national exam. All right, geographers, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I'm Mr. Sin. Until next time, I'll see you online.